We got no food. We got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off. What's up, everybody? Joe Simons, like diamonds, got Luke Simons here. We're talking about the seven reasons why you're not catching redfish. And we're going to talk about how to find them, which is really the ultimate goal as uh, anglers. And I, if you guys are watching, you know why I just said we got no food, we got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off because I'm wearing the shirt from Dumb and Dumber. Uh, but it's also because it's it's how we feel sometimes, right? Um, we know because, you know, we were ex-bass guys, and I remember the transition from going to bass, because we only fished, and we lived on a little lake, and there's three lakes, and they're all small. Like, you know, you could row across, across them real easy in a canoe small. So we knew all the spots. We knew where the structure was, right? And it, it wasn't easy to catch bass, but it was kind of easy towards the end and so we kind of felt like oh how hard can it be to go saltwater fishing all of a sudden you get out there right luke and you see these wide open flats like sometimes never ending and then the mangrove lines all look the exact same when you first get out there and it looks nothing like you thought it would look like after looking at google map and it can be really really frustrating so we we know firsthand it was tough yeah and the lakes we grew up on there there are three lakes but they're all private and so there really wasn't as much fishing pressure either so we transitioned to salt water way more expansive and way more boats too so so there's really a lot more it was a really difficult transition uh, that took many many years of frustration and now looking back we're like oh man like we like why didn't we think of that you know yeah. and uh, so that's why we're doing this video just cover the the seven core things that that we firsthand witnessed and that we see over and over again when uh, when coaching clients and um, it's a, a really continuous trend that is uh, that is pretty easy to to fix once you at least identify what they are yep and number one it by far because if you just get this and this is what we focus on in our insider club that this is the number one focus because if you get this everything else is easier the, the lures fall into place the rod reel the tackle your boat kayak doesn't really even matter if you get this you will find the fish and that's focusing on the 90 10 zone. So we knew in bass fishing, right? It was structure. We knew where every piece of structure was on this entire three lakes. I mean, right. We, we'd gone down diving and snorkeling to just fishing them and, and feeling exactly where every piece of structure was. We knew where that structure was and lo and behold, you know, in each of those three ponds, you know, uh, 90% of the feeding bass were in 10% of the area. Like, we, and we knew those 10% spots and we hit them up every single time. And it's the same with saltwater fish. Saltwater fishing's a little bit more challenging because you have tides, right? And, and fish, especially some of these schooling fish, they're moving around a whole lot more than bass. Bass, for the most part, depending on the season, will kind of stay in that same spot. You know, there's been studies on, on bass, you know, on bass fishing that when you release them, a lot of times, if you release it in the same area, it goes right back to, to where it was. It, for the most part, it stays in that general area. They might reposition, you know, based on the size and kind of the, the alpha bass might kick out the smaller ones if they're a little bit further back in structure. But for the most part, they hang around the same little area. Whereas, you know, redfish and speckled trout, snook and flounder, they're moving a whole lot more, right? They're going off and spawning. They're doing a lot more moving than a, a normal, let's just say, largemouth bass. But once you can dial that in based on trends, which is what we focus on in the Insider Club, it gets so much easier. So that 90 10 zone, once again, 90% of the feeding fish are in 10% of any area at any given time and everything else is a dead zone right but let's talk about what just happened this week luke you we went out to film some insider tips and you know it's it's cold as we're filming this right now and had we not found that little 10 percent zone where 90 percent of the red we saw like 60 70 redfish they were all in one specific area based on trends and had someone else gone out right near us and not known where to look they would have thought this is a the worst place in the world, there's no redfish at all. And we saw a ton and caught a few. So kind of talk about that in terms of the importance of 90-10. Yeah, and so as we're filming this, this is winter time. So seasonally, you know, these the, the, the zones change, right? It's not, um, unfortunately, if it would be so much easier if the fish were always in the same spot, you know, every, every tide cycle, that's not the case at all. And that's why it's a little bit more complex. Well, so what, what, once you know the formula, it's, it's actually quite easy. And in this case, we were, we were fishing, it's actually E.G. Simmons is where we were uh, fishing, this is in Tampa Bay. And we filmed an inside report, so you'll be able to see all the details uh, later on, and I'll probably publish it next, uh, probably in a few days will be ready. But 
Um, and this is a, a winter, a winter period. And one of the insider club members, uh, a new, a new member that just joined, he was actually out there the day before I saw his post in the community platform that he was there and he didn't catch anything, he got totally skunked. And so I was just like, oh man, and a uh, cold front had just come through. And it was just one of those days that I really don't like where there's just clear blue skies and it's just tough. I, I like it. having cloud cover is just a whole lot easier because these redfish in the winter time, as soon as that sun starts coming up, they'll push up in really shallow water. That's a hint for, for identifying 90 10 zone. They will not be in the open bay, right? You can automatically, if it's 10 foot depth with flat sand, which is like most of the bay, that's automatically X'd out of, oh, we've got a lure sticking to my arm. <laughs> that's automatically X'd out of, of your, your areas of interest, all right? So focus on the, the shallows and then the wind protected shallows to, to add a little bit uh, extra clarity. And as soon as we started, um, once that sun came up, uh, as soon as we started just hitting those exact type of spots, literally every single one of them had a pocket of fish. And it went from going on the outside zones, we, we covered a lot of water because you have to go through, um, it's a pretty long distance from one, one of these spots to the other. And we were just buzzing down with the trolling motor and some of the longer expanses, we, we put the big motor down. But we literally saw like two, I think I, I, I remember it was like two redfish over like a three mile period, right? That's horrible. That's not many fish where if you spook two fish, you're the amount of, you know, you're probably not any, uh, any chance catching any. But then as soon as you get around to one of those little bins and get to that little pocket, right, that 90, 10 zone, there's like 30, like all right there in one little spot. So wintertime fishing, it's, uh, it could be good and bad, right? The, the bad is that, the con is that they're harder to find because they're, they're really concentrated. But once you know how to unlock where they are and predict where they're going to be, it's like, it's the, the best time of the, of the season to fish because you can just go literally go to a spot you've never been to before. Like what we were doing that trip and literally look on a map and know what the tide's doing, know what the wind's doing and what the weather's been like a training, training hot or training cold. Like we teach in the weekly game plans and you can say, okay, they'll probably be there. They'll be there. They'll be there and there. And uh, obviously it's not always gonna be perfect, but in that instance, it was like four out of five of those spots were loaded, absolutely loaded. And uh, again, six years ago, we would have gone out and fished that general area and we would have seen two redfish, right? We and, and, here's the biggest, and here's the biggest mistake we would have done. And this is where, where so many people fail. You know, when you find that 10% zone where the 90% of like we, we literally saw six redfish right away what most people did, and we were tempted to, was when you see that first redfish, Luke said we were kind of buzzing the shoreline is to stop, power pull down, and fish that area hard. Like, I, the, no, like we were tempted to, we're still looking around. Like, if we see another one, then we probably will, but you'll know when you hit that zone. Whereas most people, they, they, in the area look good. It, it looked fishy. For most of us, we'd have said, man, this area looks awesome, but we didn't see bait. We didn't see any birds and we saw one fish that spooked off. So we keep going. We literally don't even stop and fish that area until you're confident or at least mostly sure that you're in that 90 10 zone. That's what separates the people who are catching a ton of fish from the ones who are getting skunked and frustrated. Cause we know we did it forever. We normally would have seen that one fish and we would have been power pulled down, anchor down, and we would have fished that area for 30 minutes. There was nothing else there. I mean, we know we, we buzzed the whole thing. And so that's incredibly important to, to not even try to fish hard, at least until you know you're in that zone. Uh, let's move on. It says number one, not fishing in the 90-10 zone. And obviously the opposite of that is fishing in a dead zone. So number two and three kind of go hand in hand. Number two is not understanding the current trends. And, and usually when you're or not even understanding trends at all, like Luke mentioned, we, we're looking for different types of spots in the winter versus spring or, or summer for redfish, right? They behave differently. They're, they're a little bit more predictable in certain seasons. And so if, if you're not focused on trends, guess what you're focused on? Spots, right? Give me a GPS spot. Just give me that spot. And, that not, and, and spots are important, but because fish have tails and no fences, they are constantly moving. And what so many people do is they get so focused on the spot, right? And they don't want to learn anything. And so they just want someone to give them that spot. And and that spot might have been great yesterday or a month ago, and it could be horrible today. It's happened to all of us. Oh, man, that person gave me a bad spot. They said they call these fish. They, there was nothing here. 
It's because you're not focused on the trends and, and shame on all of us. We're all guilty of it, which ties into number three. We'll just skip right to number three, which is just going back to the same spots over and over again, basically because of number two, because we're not focused on the trends. And dude, we're still guilty of that, right? There's still been days where we just kind of get lazy and we don't do any pre-trip planning. Like, oh, let's just go back to the last spot we caught a redfish. What happens usually? Yeah, it's not good. And, and, <laughs> and as, as Joe said, yeah, the, it's the spots because the most common thing we see just on, on fishing forums and, and it's just, it's just our nature, right? Is somebody will say, Hey, I'm going to fish, you know, wherever, say book of Graham, I'm going there in three weeks. Where should I fish? Right. Where should I fish? But if anybody answers that question and they don't, they don't know like what time you're fishing like what the tides are doing, what the wind direction is going to be, then the answer they give is really not going to be very accurate because you have to base your spot selection based on the weather and and the tides and because that's what that's what encompasses the, the trends that we're talking about we're talking about the feeding trends how are these fish feeding where are they moving based on the based on the weather and based on the current flow if if you're not because that, that was the biggest thing that for many years that we did not factor in it was all about spots as just said we would buy all those maps that show all those fancy you know little highlighted spots to fish and they say oh, there'd be redfish here trout here whatever and and but really nothing nothing really granular and, and so without knowing that extra level of detail again weather trends is it getting colder is it getting warmer really big deal especially in the winter time and then uh, and then wind direction as well huge huge deal uh, all seasons and then the uh, the, the actual uh, 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 tide oh sorry current flow yeah is it coming in is it going out how deep is it going to be at that spot so that, that, that's like the extra layer of detail that, that you really need to factor in if you really want to be consistent. Yeah. And if you're wondering, how do I find out all this stuff? That's what we teach in the Insider Club. That's, that's what the entire club, that's why we have 26,000 members and the vast majority of them keep renewing year after year because it's that helpful. It's giving you the cheat sheet, the, you know, the, the hall pass, if you will, to go out there and find the fish as fast as humanly possible. We're still going to put work in, right? Um, and that, that's, that's the irony, right? So many people think, oh, I'm going to sign up and they're just going to give me all these GPS spots. Well, we, we do give you some spots, but, but more importantly, we, we teach you why those spots are good and why they're going to change and, and what kind of areas and what type of structure, and what type of depth and what tide to go fish in your area every single weekend, right? Cause it changes, right? It's just not a, a, a record on, on replay with this, Hey, just go fish this exact same spot. And, and we did that. That's why we're hammering this because we did this for so long. One, we weren't focused on trends. It was all about GPS spots. And then three, I guess it was two and three, three, we would keep going back to our same handful of spots where we caught redfish before. And, and that sometimes it worked, right? I mean, a broken clock is right a couple of times a day, but for the most part, we ended up just frustrated and like we couldn't figure it out. So that's two and three. Number four is now we're starting to talk about the wrong lure or bait. If you're in the live bait, you know, either the wrong lure at the wrong time, like just not matching the hatch or just horrible presentation. Cause we've seen both, right? We have some people where the fish are dialed in on small little minners, right? Little small fish. And someone's from this big nine inch paddle tail because they caught one big snooker red in, a, in, a, in an inlet before with it. Like, no, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be smart about it. And the other one is just not having it rigged correctly, live bait or, or lure, where it's just not even a great presentation where it's just, it's spooking the, especially the, the bigger fish get spooked easily when they see something that does not look natural. And so Luke, you want to talk about really those two issues. Yeah, I mean, wrong lure or presentation. In most cases, the presentation. A lot of times, the fish they're they're going on motion. And, and there's a there's a study. I can't remember who published it. it I read it years ago, and it is it was a, a game changer for me. But it was it was measuring how fish react to certain things, and they so they had a controlled environment, and they would use they focused on action, like action of the lure, the uh, the size of the lure, and I believe uh, I guess it was smell was the other one. And um, oh, sorry, color. And, and either way, action was number one by far. So it was the action of lure was number one. And so a lot of a lot of people they'll go and just take a lure and just cast it out and just do like a a really slow retrieve without giving like a like a we'll say like a power you know, power prawn like a lure that doesn't have a lot of motion by itself. But when when switched properly is amazingly effective. Um, so if you just don't do the retrieve properly for the specific lure, that can significantly hinder the ability and just retrieve speed, right? Sometimes 
the, the fish are active and they will actually only hit a fast retrieve. Like if it's too slow, they, they really won't respond nearly as well. Um, and other days where the, the, the problem days are usually when the fish are really lethargic and that's when you have to go super slow. Cause if, even if you're going moderately slow, um, they just lay flat out, won't, won't chase it down. Um, so a lot of it is, is again, trying to match the mood of the fish, but, uh, but soft plastics too, rigging is a huge deal. That's probably the number one issue that I've seen. Soft plastics are amazing. They're incredibly effective all season long. Uh, if they're rigged properly, if they're not rigged properly they're they will not work at all. And so like that, that's one thing I've, I've, uh, you know, go, do a lot of meetups and, and try to, you know, now that COVID's finally getting over and, uh, meet up with a lot more people and, and just, just meet new people even at the ramp or fishing off piers and, and kind of look at what they're, when I'm chatting with them, look at what they're, what they're using. And it is, it is shocking how frequently a soft plastic plastic is, is improperly rigged. And, and when that happens, that almost guarantees you're not going to catch anything. And it, it just takes a little bit. That's totally on us, right? So that's on us as anglers. Um, there's not many things we can control in fishing, but our knots and how our lures are rigged, that's totally on us. And all it takes is just a little bit of time just to just think you know think through and then after you after you put it on might examine it right like here's a slam shade 2.0 rigged on a uh, on a twist lock hook right is it is it streamlined does it does it look proper it does, are there any kinks in it more than anything right if i went too far in there and and have it rigged like this right now there's it's not a huge deal but there's a little bit of a kink right there and that's not going to look nearly as good in the water and so it just needs to be streamlined and you can see in the water right put rig it up drag in the water a little bit and, and you'll see if it looks natural or not. If it's doing the helicopter roll time to don't make it, don't even cast, just go ahead and re, redo it and fix it. Yep. And, and that's another, you know, big reason we take all these lures and put them on different types of hooks and different types of jig heads and different weights to see what it looks like in the pool. I mean, we spend a lot of time in the pool just to GoPro behind it. And we study that stuff because the other piece of it is having the right weight. And we've talked about this a lot, meaning the depth coverage, right? Uh, you know, Tony mentions that he's like super simple. He only has a couple lures, like even Luke. I mean, we basically use Slam Shady and, uh, and, and Power Prawn 90% of the time. And then the rest of it, we'll have a whole, you know, tackle tray of this one's empty. or got a couple little hooks in there, but of just jig heads, right? Of just jig heads and different hooks, different weights. Because remember that, that one of the very first podcasts we did live on the water, it was you and I fishing. I'm the same little skiff. We're literally like, shoulder to shoulder up at the front and we had the exact same lure same rod same reel same line same leader everything was identical except you had a slightly heavier jig head and i'm talking about slightly right and that made all the difference that That made all the difference in the world i wasn't catching anything i was like what's going on as soon as i switched to the same weight uh all of a sudden i was getting down in the water column right where the feeding fish were in that 90 10 zone and all of a sudden I, I started, you know, I, I caught a snook right away and I was like, doggone it. So uh, there, and, and that, that part's really frustrating. And that one, that one's a little bit tougher to figure out, but then again, you get used to it just like anything. And when you have a club like ours, where you can ask questions and say, Hey, I'm, I, and we even have a little cheat sheets. Hey, if you're going to be fishing in this depth, here's the exact size weight you want to use. Here's how to retrieve it, et cetera. So we just try to like shorten the learning curve for everyone. If we, if we have full-time guides, who a lot of times, you know, have just kind of gotten used to live bait and they're going through these cheat sheets and stuff saying, man, this is incredibly powerful stuff. It just shorten the learning curve. Yeah, that day was awesome. I remember that was the first time we decided, okay, we're just going to do a fishing show with zero edits and whatever happens the next 30 minutes goes. And, uh, and, and Joe was, Joe was not having a good day. <laughs> I felt like this. Yeah. I felt like Petey, and, my pet. And, and I noticed it because I, every time I fish with somebody, I always look at what they're doing. Right, because you learn a lot from that. You can you can now start doing some a, like A B split tests. And I saw that he was using a, a little bit lighter jig head. It was it wasn't much. He was using a three sixteenths ounce trout eye jig head. I was using the same brand of jig head with the same shade two point as he was, but I had the quarter ounce. So I was literally just a one sixteenth ounce heavier, and my retrieve is a little bit slower. And uh, and that's that was literally that that small two little small little tweaks was what took me. I had it amazingly. I caught like eight or eight or nine snook. And then Joe finally caught one at the very end to, to have him not totally cry out there. But, okay, let's but move depth, on here. Let's move yeah, on. But depth control, I, just one last thing, because this is depth control is incredibly important and it, it is a little bit complex. So we did put together a cheat sheet and, and it's available for you. We'll put a link down below. You can, 
or you can go to saltron.com and search for like depth, um, lure depth cheat sheet. And it's literally for all of the core lures it is for each lure, you know, different lures require, you can't just go a quarter ounce jig head for a soft plastic to get down to three to four feet. It depends on which plastic it is. Is it a paddle tail? Is it like a Z-man bait that's more buoyant? And so it goes through all the stuff you need to know and you can literally just see this little grid. Okay, I'm using this lure. I need this depth. Okay, I need this jig head or this weighted hook. So that's on our website, totally free um, because it's, it's super important. Cool. And yeah, that's, that's one of the freebies. Um, so wait till you see the stuff that you get as an insider member. Um, so number five, I'll start off with the story. Luke went fishing with this guy at one time who really was struggling to catch fish, had a nice boat and Luke's up on front about to deploy the, the trawl motor. And, and, um, they didn't really catch much. And so I talked to Luke afterwards and, and I, I said, uh, I said, man, how'd it go? He goes, well, I, I now know why the guy's not catching any fish. I was like, what happened? He's like, well, he goes, I'm, I'm basically still pulling spider webs out of my hair from being in the mangroves. He's like, this guy, Luke's literally up there trying to help him and like, dude, slow down. And he, he goes all the way up, like where Luke actually went into the mangroves, like what is happening? And you can probably guess what the problem is. It was just horrible positioning and approach, right? I mean, stealth is key. If you are not positioning whatever piece of structure whether it's mangroves if you have them in florida or oyster bars or docks or shorelines or whatever it is it's critical based on the wind and and obviously you know currents if, you, if you're dealing with that and and if you go the wrong way or even approach it from the wrong side you and obviously if you're going in too fast like that you could literally spook out the entire area it could be that 90 10 zone like well you, you work so hard to find the fish and then you literally blow out the entire spot because of, of bad positioning. And this happens in kayaks where you're loud and you're clanking around with your paddle hitting the, the board. I mean, all these small things add up so much. Um, what are your thoughts there, Luke? Because this is a tough one. We have a whole course, by the way. Uh, yep. that it's really the foundation, I believe. You got finding the fish, right? The, the finding spot, the fishing spots is the first course we put all of our members through. And then the positioning and approach. And if you're a current member and haven't gone through those two, do it. It, it will literally change your whole fishing game. Because that part, it's something that no one teaches. The fishing shows don't teach it. The fishing magazines don't teach it. YouTube doesn't teach it because it's kind of boring, right? But it, it's, it's, the, it's the basics. It's the foundation. It's just like golf. Everyone wants to drive the thing 350 yards, but it's the putting that separates the guys who are getting paid millions versus the guys who are caddies. So, I mean, it, it's basically the putting of, of, of inshore saltwater fishing and it's absolutely critical. Yeah, and that, the course, the positioning course, it goes into the, the you know, mechanics of, you know, judging the wind and the current and how to position based on, you know, what the wind's doing. Obviously, if the current flow is really strong, the fish are gonna be aimed into the current and, and you really have to retrieve with the current. If you take it from its tail, it's just not natural. It'll probably spook the fish. Um, but I'll say the number one issue that I've seen with the positioning, Joe hinted on it, that. I've had multiple multiple times where you fish with uh, with a friend or, or or a client and go on their boat just to help them get situated and you know invest in a ton of money in this nice boat get the fancy trolling motor right with the spot lock which is extremely helpful but that's like the most dangerous thing you can have if you get too comfortable or if you are too quick to hit that little anchor button that's the best way to spook fish and, and I see it all the time and going down this fly, the wind's blowing you, whether you're drifting or just going the trolling motor, you get in a good spot. Okay, immediately, what's your immediate thought? I've got this anchor button, right? If I want to stay put, all I have to do is click this one button and I'm going to stay put. Um, makes sense, sense in theory, but when you hit that anchor button, as the boat has momentum going elsewhere, that's an, a heavy boat that has to immediately stop. And when you hit that anchor button, that trolling motor is going to go buzz, buzz around and then immediately set a huge pulse of water. And that pulse of water is going to go ex exactly where you don't want, you know, where, exactly where the fish are. So it basically just spook everything. It's, so if you want to spook fish, the best way to do it is to just quickly hit that anchor button when, you're, when, you're, uh, when, you're, when your boat has momentum and those fish are going to be gone. And so in shallow water, I recommend just don't ever hitting the anchor button personally. But if you do, just do it gradually. Do it manually. Manually stop the boat, boat's momentum. And then, then only time to hit the anchor button is when that boat's momentum is totally stopped. And that when you hit that anchor button, it's not going to jolt because that jolt is the, 
I mean, you, you, you better off stomping around the boat than hitting, having that big jolt of water go towards the fish. Cause they might, they don't know what it is, but they know something big's around. It might be a dolphin, but yep. they know something big's around. They better, they better be super careful and, and they'll be gone. So make sure to not make that mistake. I, I've seen that so many times. Yep. That's a good one. And just, just always think stealth, right? I mean, this is hunting, right? You, you wouldn't go up to a, a deer stand and you know, there's deers nearby, you know, blaring your, your radio and trying to be loud as possible and breaking branches, you, you go, you're in stealth mode. Uh, especially if you're going up to an area that you've identified and you're seeing bait and things like that. I mean, go super stealthily, which ties in to number six, which is fishing in areas that don't have a source of food and or structure. And most of the time of the year, like in our, you know, we have a, a private uh, insider little uh, app and everything. And, you know, the, the, a lot of the reports, because there's reports going up every few minutes, and, and this isn't the true all year long, but for the most of the year it is, where, you know, the people put the little tips and tactics at the bottom. And what do they always say, Luke? Like, I found them where the mullet were, or I found them where this school of bait was. Like, fish aren't dumb. Like, they only have, you know, I guess they are kind of not as smart as humans, but they have really two, two things on their mind, right, is, is eating and not getting killed so you know they're going to be around structure not to get killed and they also want to be around structure because that's normally where the bait is because that little small bait's having the same the same two thoughts and so you know, so many times we used to do that we, we thought a place look fishy for whatever reason and if you're not seeing any bait i would usually suggest moving on there might be some times in the in the winter where you know bait is not as plentiful but for the most of the year you know, we would, and I've watched you do it. You're really good. You sit there and just scan the horizon. You're looking for jumping mullet, right? Just one mullet usually means there's a school around like, all right, let's just go fish that, that spot. Or if you see birds up on the shoreline or up on an oyster bar, that usually means they're, they're not sitting there for their health and they're not sunning. They're usually looking right down, trying to eat some bait. That usually means there's some predator fish down there. And so, um, that, that bait part is, uh, is, is critical. And once again, usually bait kind of ties in with, with structure. It's usually not just sitting around in some random area. Yeah. And, and it's the bait structure combo. It really depends on what you're going after, but like redfish, sea trout, snook flounder, those are like the four species that our, that our club is really, really focused on. Obviously we talk about triple tail and, and sheep's head and stuff too, but for those redfish, sea trout, snook flounder, all those species, they're ambush predators. And so they're not going to be sitting out in the middle of the bay. Even if there's a huge school of bait and birds dive in the middle of the bay, if there's no structure, on the bottom or somewhere near for them to hide an ambush prey from, there's not going to be fish. You might get some mackerel, you might get some sharks and stuff out on those little bait pods that are out in the middle of the bay, but you're not going to be getting the redfish, you trust, snook flounder. Where do you find that is you need to have the structure, whether it's docks, rocks, you know, um, bridge pilings, oysters, seagrass, like literally anything other than flat sand. If you have that, ideally more, you know, multiple in one area. And if you have that good structure plus bait fish, that's that's going to skyrocket the odds that you're in a 90-10. It won't guarantee it, but it'll skyrocket the odds that it's a 90-10 zone. And so, again, another thing Joe and I did for many years is is we would just go out and if we see a bird dive, oh man, let's go over there. There's there's, there's action and squirrel. And it could be yeah, it could be just a school of bait. And in, in many cases, it was just a big pot of bait that was just going in with the current, and uh, there was no structure. They weren't holding there. They were just passing through. And uh, yeah, we caught some ladyfish and Spanish mackerel doing that, but we were, we'd like never caught redfish for the longest time yep. until we started focusing on the, the structure and really fishing like, like, a, like, like shallow water bass fishing. Um, yep. And you can find trout in those little schools. Like if you see those birds on a flat or something, but, but you consistently find nice because a lot of us want to catch redfish. That's one of the, the top things we hear from our insider club members is, you know, I'm finding some trout. I, I really want to catch some redfish and, and flounder and even snook. And normally you're going to have to go to the structure almost always. Uh, but still just looking for birds is a good start. I think most of the year, and, and this is all over, uh, not, not just here in Florida, it's, it's mullet. I mean, if you find schools of mullet, um right if you're just going to pick one to concentrate on and, and they will jump if you give enough time they usually are jumping the whatever they're doing that for to get their um parasites off their body or whatever they're doing but mullet usually do jump i mean same mullet jump here in south florida and central florida texas i mean it, it's a great way to identify areas where there's usually some redfish uh if you just wanted to focus on one and, and even right now i mean we're still seeing some schools of mullet here and it's freezing uh so they're still out there 
any more thoughts on on that on food source and structure no again um it's a bit it's a big thing but yeah that's yeah. it just look for that and obviously we to for help just using online maps you know a course that we do offer to on-site club members it's the only way to get it actually it's the finding spots mastery course it really goes into that and into how to use free online maps like google being or MapQuest or a variety of others and, and just quickly and easily just zoom down and, and then just identify from the map the, the spots that are most likely those 90 10 zones and I've, again that's not, never gonna be perfect but you get good and you pick out five or six at least a few of them are gonna be are gonna hold some fish yep cool number seven bad tide or time of day no current flow and you know we have a tool that's really awesome uh, it's called the strike score and that's as far inside our members as uh, as well that it it once again kind of like a little cheat sheet It'll show you based on time of day on every single day. And, it, and it's changing every 15 minutes based on, you know, all kinds of different things from barometric pressure and weather and, uh, and obviously the, the tides and moon phases. And it just gives you an idea of what the best time of day based on tides and also, you know, depending on the season, based on some other variables. And uh, there's been so many times, too, that we've gone out and there's just been no flow, right? And no matter how hard, you, even if you're in a good spot, there could be fish down there. They're just not feeding. Uh, and that happens. We see hear a lot of people, man, I, I actually see the fish. I know they're down there and there's, they're not biting anything. Sometimes just the wrong time of day. Uh, and that could be tough, right? Because, you know, areas are different. You got places like Indian River Lagoon, and, you know, you don't have the same kind of tidal flow. But what are, you, what are your thoughts there? What's, what would have been the biggest lessons learned on t- fish and tides in the time of day? I mean, it's really about spot selection, um, and, and there are because there are some like slack period. Slack tide is is generally going to be the toughest time to catch fish. That's basically like in between the the tide cycles, so there's really just like no water movement. Um, it, it's going to be the toughest time to catch fish. It's not going to mean that it's the it's not going to catch you're not going to catch any fish, and so you need to just target the target some some specific spots. This is obviously based on the season, but. Um, one like around like a pass or an inlet where the the change is is pretty brief and, and a lot of times in the in the really heavy current periods those areas are really tough to fish and a lot of times like those zones have like a, a really good bite like right as that tide starts moving or right before it stops um, or you can go into like a, a back cove where there's really not much tide tide movement and and the fish really don't care about the the current flow as much and in the winter time in particular that's what that's really what I do and so like this season, I really don't care so much about the tide. If, if I'm going out for redfish in particular, I don't care nearly as much about the tide as I do normally like during the summer. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it's time of day, right? Based on the season, time of day is more important than than the uh, tide cycle and vice versa. And and as we talked about earlier, it's just knowing the trends, like knowing the trends on what on what's going on. Um, so it gets complex. Obviously, we can't cover all that in one one quick this video like this, but. But just know that even though like there, there's no time of the day where you're just going to have zero chance of catching a fish. Um, so, so there's always going to be some sort of pivot you can make to, to, to get onto some feeding fish. I had one of my, one of my best days. I remember it was, uh, it was when I was in Tampa and I, I was testing out this new lure that I just got. I really want to go out. The only time I can go was right in the middle of the day. And it was on one of those, one of those tide charts where it like goes up and then flattens out like the whole afternoon and then starts going back up again. So like the, the whole middle of the day was nothing total slack period, like a four or five hour slack period on the Gulf coast. We have weird tides like that. And I had, I crushed them. I absolutely crushed them. Cause I went to a spot, it was cold and I just went to a cove, right? Fish don't care about the current flow there. They, and they were actually warm and they were super happy. And I had an amazing time. I caught a nice slam, even with Otis on the boat, he fell in a couple of times and, uh, and it was a blast, right? So, so just don't be afraid of slack period, but just be recognize it and, and know the type of spots to go to so um so yeah don't we used to just like not even bother we used to only fish during the the top of the incoming tide remember that we would like plan our vacations because we thought that was that that was what we heard from some of our favorite fishing shows that that's the time to do it and and uh yeah it's great but i mean now that's kind of my least favorite time because it's just uh this fish have a lot more places to hide yeah love it well um I'll, let's let's go through all seven again so that was uh number seven we just did which is you know fishing the wrong tides or bad time of day or not understanding them. 
Uh, so number one, not fishing in the 90-10 zone, which means you're fishing in a dead zone. So not understanding that 90-10 zone. Number two, don't understand the current trends, which in turn means you only focus on just GPS spots. Number three ties in with that, which is just going back to your same handful of spots or only two spots. Maybe for some of you, the two places you caught redfish in the past, you keep going back over and over and over and over again. Uh, number four is wrong lure bait and or bad presentation or, or bad rigging or wrong weight. Something to do with just your lure or your bait not looking uh, appropriate, not looking real, or not being in in that in the in the in the zone, right down in the ninety ten zone, uh, depending on where these fish are uh, are feeding. Uh, number five, bad positioning and approach, which results in spooking the fish in many cases, blowing out the entire area. They're telling all their friends about you and laughing at your back. Number six, no food source and or not enough structure. Well, those two usually go hand in hand. And then number seven, we just covered bad time or bad time, bad tide or bad time of day. So those are the seven. There's probably so many more. Those are the seven that kind of came up. And, and all this came about because, you know, we get a lot of comments on, on YouTube. You might be watching this on YouTube of people saying, oh, man, I, I really just want to go out and catch redfish. And, and, and fishing's never just easy. Even the pros will say that the guy's like Captain Peter Deeks, one of our fishing coaches, is on the water 300 days a year. He's like, it's never easy, but it gets a whole lot easier when you understand this stuff. And it's a reason he's in the community. I mean, he's you know creating content for us and learning from it as well. I mean, fishing is an ongoing, like never-ending process of, of learning. We, we always call it the, the puzzle that never ends. You just kind of keep getting closer and closer to having it complete. And, and that's part of the fun of it is just, you know, becoming better, becoming an expert at uh, something. And so it's been really neat with our, our fishing club in the beginning. I'll be honest, it, it attracted a lot of a lot of newbies. And then we started attracting a lot of weekend warriors. People are saying, well, man, this this is helpful for anyone. And now even full time guides are signing up and joining. So if if this was helpful and, and you're not a member yet, I know a lot of our members listen to the podcast and watch this as well. But if you're not a member, come join us. I mean, we have a 365 day 100% money back guarantee. We, Luke and I are brothers and we were raised by hardworking parents that said, you know, you guys don't deserve to keep anyone's money if you're not adding value to their life. And so we said, cool, when we sell a product or service, we're going to put a monster guarantee on there that we wish all companies would do. And if at the end of a year, you haven't found more fish, right? That's number one. That's goal number one is you finding fish, like you quickly and confidently being able to find where the fish are in that 90, 10 cents. That's number one. So that will happen if you go through this and go through those two courses we talked about, right? I mean, it only took a couple hours here of your life and you will have more knowledge than most inshore saltwater anglers in the country if you just go through those two courses so number one that you will find the fish number two saving money on the tackle that's something that we added on over the past two years is we have a lot of our proprietary lures but now i have rods and reels and all kinds of lures and line and terminal tackle from a lot of the biggest brands out there and we personally go out and test the stuff we have no sponsors we've had companies who have tried to sponsor us and we've turned all of them down because we want to be unbiased and tell you guys here's what works and then give you 20 to even 30% off all of that tackle. So number two is you will save money on your tackle. And then the third part is, is really unique to the club because it's a club. As I mentioned, we have an online progressive app and a, a very active community of anglers helping anglers and sharing. And so part number three is that you will meet friends and you will be part of an amazing community where there's no cursing. There's no negativity. There's no belittling. There's just, there's nothing but being helpful, genuine people. And, and we've kicked a few people out and just given their money back. Uh, we just don't have time. For, there's enough negativity in this world. We don't need any more when it comes to our fishing, right? There's enough politics in this world. We don't need more when it comes to fishing, right? So there's no politics, no politicking, no belittling, just positive, helpful people who are sharing fishing reports, asking good questions where our fishing coaches can come, come get help. And, and now we've had people who've literally created some really cool bonds and friendships that they've met in the community from doing little meetups and, and, uh, and hanging out at their, you know, local marina or boat ramp or kayak launch or even pub. So it's been, it's been really neat to see that part of it grow. It really has kind of turned into a family. So that's all at saltstrong.com. Come join us. And then now almost what 26,000 members in the insider club. It's saltstrong.com. 
Yeah, I'd one more thing too. That, I mean, those foundational courses are, are incredibly important. And you might've been, oh man, I don't have two or three hours to go through them. That's okay, right? We, we, we know that a lot of your time is valuable. And, and so every week, literally every Friday, we do what's called the weekend game plan. And that'll be 10 minutes or less. You're going to get a snapshot. It's like a cliff notes, if you will, but it'll be a snapshot on and that'll go through exactly what we just talked about, what the recent feeding trends are. Um, show and then look at the upcoming weather and tides, right? And, and just help you, help guide you to the right type spot based on the conditions. That way, if you don't have time to yet to go through those those courses, which I st st still recommend you do at some point, but you can just, at 10 minutes a day, you will be way ahead of the curve as far as, far as knowing uh, where to fish and making sure that you're going to have the highest odds of being in that 90 10 zone. It'll guarantee that you're that you minimize your time in those dead zones that are just going to be a, a total time suck. Yep. So if you don't have at least 10 minutes a week to dedicate to becoming a better angler, then it's probably not a fit for you, but even if you're time strapped or just stinking lazy angler, which is part of many of us, we can still help you out, but you have to have at least 10 minutes. And, uh, and if you got that and you want to invest a little bit in yourself, we're talking 27 cents a day is what the cost comes down to. And you break it down. It will change your game. You will find more fish. And you will save money in your tackle. We also, we want you to be able to justify it just from the tackle savings that you will uh, make that up over a year. No brainer. And then just meeting great friends uh, in your area. So hope you will join us in the 26,000 others and hope you found this helpful. And if you have any questions on this or any other, uh, you know, just any other issues you're having when it comes to finding redfish or, or trout, snook, flounder, snap or anything uh, let us know we, we'd love to hear from you we love getting uh, feedback and the best place is uh is actually on our site saltstrong.com there's a little fishing tips section and you'll see this podcast slash tip in there and at the bottom leave a question it comes right to us uh right via the old somewhere in the internet it comes boop, 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 right to our phone ding i just got one over here yeah it's science uh so guys we appreciate you i hope you found this one helpful and uh we are off and um stay warm out there too all right yeah. See ya. Peace. If you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the best fishing club for inshore saltwater anglers, especially if you're going after redfish, sea trout, snook, or flounder. There's nothing else like it. We actually guarantee that you'll be catching more fish while saving both time and money. We do that through our premium education, our exclusive insider community, and huge discounts on all the tackle you need. To learn more, go to saltstrong.com. Otherwise, hope to see you again soon.